the basic refrigeration cycle and we'll see how that all relates. I know modules one and two are tough. A lot of formulas, a lot of talk about um, how many BTUs does it take to take a 10 pound block of ice at minus 10 degrees and, and make it into 250 degrees steam. But uh, that's all for a purpose. We'll kind of get into that in just a bit. Okay, the first definition, heat. Now, when you think of heat as a human being, that is like your stove and it's hot and you get burnt. Truly, heat is just a form of energy and its molecules in motion. So even with an ice cube that's at 32 degrees, there are molecules in that ice that are moving and there's still heat there. Um, it isn't until you get down to minus 460 degrees and all molecular motion stops. And uh, that's never been reached yet. They, you can get down pretty close to that. But um, so I want you to start thinking of heat as molecules in motion, not so much as um, something that is hot to your touch. And heat always flows from a substance that has more heat or more molecules and motions to one with less heat. This will give you a, a quick example right here. For example, this block of ice at 32 degrees does have molecules in motion, but they're pretty much bonded together and they're not moving very much. They're just sitting here pretty, um, while they are moving, they are not um, bouncing into each other too much are more or less bound together and that's why we that gives ice its um, solid form and as we start to add heat to the the ice and it begins to melt the molecules begin to move a little bit faster so not only are they bound together they they start to cut loose their binds with each other and turn into a liquid and they start to exert some force in the um, downwards and outwards direction like in this container then as we add more heat and we turn this um, water and liquid into vapor, those molecules are bouncing around really fast and it exerts pressure in all directions. And, and that's the one thing you need to remember when uh, we're talking about pressure. That's where you get pressure that this example here that sh shows that blows the cork off the bottom. You get so much energy and pressure in here that um, in the form of heat. Okay, heat flow. When I talked about heat earlier, as molecules in motion. So this makes sense to us. If we have a 100 degree Fahrenheit block of lead here um, and set it next to a 75 degree Fahrenheit block of lead, of course, we, we recognize that the heat will flow from the substance with more heat or molecules in motion to one with less. But now we, we don't usually think of minus 200 degree Fahrenheit and minus 350 degree Fahrenheit as having heat, but it still does. It has molecules in motion, although not as much as, as these blocks up here. There are There is heat energy contained in this block of lead and the molecular motion or heat energy will in fact flow from uh, a substance that is minus 200 degrees to minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why I want you to think about heat again as molecules of motion, not something that is hot or cold to, the, to our touch. All right, there's, in, in air conditioning, we have two forms of heat, types of heat that we like to talk about. Um, one is sensible heat, and that is where if you add heat or molecules or heat energy in molecules in motion as uh, to a substance, it changes the temperature that you can measure with a thermometer. And then we have latent heat, and that latent means hidden, and that's heat that cannot be measured by a thermometer. And what it does is at a certain point, and if we use water in the example in the textbook, when you start with a uh, 75 degree pan of water and put it on the 500 degree stove, it starts to increase the temperature. And if you have a thermometer in there, it's going to show that temperature increase. That's the sensible heat. At a certain point, at, if you're at sea level, it's 212 degrees, the water begins to boil. And, and that's changing of state from a liquid to vapor. And 
it remains steady at 212 degrees and will not, uh, that water does not increase temperature because all of that heat energy that's being absorbed is changing the state of the water from liquid to vapor. That's called latent heat because even though you're adding heat, you can't measure it with your thermometer. Okay, saturation. And we're, we'll talk about water first, then we're gonna talk about refrigerants because it's sim they're, they're very similar in their properties. The saturation is when a substance in, is in the form of both liquid and vapor, and if heat is added, it'll begin to change state into vapor. And if heat is removed, it will change state back into liquid. So the definition of saturation is when a substance is in the form of both liquid and vapor, when we add heat, it changes state, begins to change state into vapor. And when we remove heat, it will begin to change state back into liquid. And I just want to let everyone know, if you do have audio problems, please call in on the number up at top. I just got a message from one of our viewers here. Okay, changing state, and this is very important. When, when we are changing state of a liquid to a vapor, it takes a tremendous amount of heat energy, and which, is molecule, which are molecules in motion, to change that state from liquid to vapor. And when that condenses back down from vapor to liquid, all the energy, the heat energy that's been absorbed is released. So, when you boil your water, it, it, all that heat energy, when it hits your cool window and turns back into water, releases all of that heat back into the atmosphere. Okay, and from now on, I want us to think about, not to think about boiling anymore, because that's just like heat for us. Boiling, we equate to water and it's hot. We want to think about changing state rather than boiling because it gets confusing with refrigerant. Again, it makes sense when you have um, a beaker of water here and you're adding heat to it and it's boiling and you put your finger in there and you get burned. But um, when we talk about refrigerate, refrigerants, they boil at much lower temperatures. So we're going we're gonna to erase boiling from our vocabulary and changing state is what we're going to talk about from here on out. All right, so here is the diagram from our textbook. And it starts out at the bottom of the, the graph at with a zero degree ice. We're not going to worry about much about this zero degree ice until we hit 32 degree water at this point right here. Let's talk about this water. We have that water on the stove like we talked about earlier. And as it is, heated up on the stove, the temperature begins to rise. At this point, we're at uh, 100 degrees over here. Now, the as that heat that is being added raises the temperature, that is the sensible heat. Remember, sensible heat is heat that can be measured with a thermometer. At 212 degrees, our water is at saturation it's at its saturation point. It is absorbed as much sensible heat as it can absorb. And any heat that is added from this point on changes the state of the water from liquid to vapor. And it doesn't matter how, many, how much heat we put on there, as long as we have liquid and both liquid and vapor together, it will absorb a tremendous amount of heat to change the state from liquid to vapor. At a certain point, when all of the liquid has been changed to vapor, it will again start to pick up sensible heat here and it raises the temperature of the steam. Now, once you take a look at this, if we take 
32 degree water and we go back down here it is it is 160 BTUs to get it to that point and then we raise the temperature to 212 degrees it only takes 180 BTUs of heat to do that that's not a lot of energy in the form of molecules in motion so raising the temperature of something really doesn't um, absorb or release a, a lot of heat but when we hit this point right here where it's at its saturation point and we take that pan of water and we turn it from liquid into vapor it it takes 970 BTU of latent heat to do that and this is with one pound of water so this is where the refrigeration process happens not with water but with refrigerant so I want you to remember that changing of state is requires a tre tremendous amount of heat in the form of molecules of motion and if we go backwards down this down this um, chart and we hit the saturation point where it is almost all steam and just starting to turn into liquid from vapor to liquid all of the heat that we gained as we travel back down from vapor to liquid that all that 970 BTUs is released from the water until it hits 211 degrees and then it's going to start losing its sensible heat. Again, this is where the refrigeration process takes takes place. All right, superheat. Once that um, liquid and in this case water but refrigerant as well once that liquid has changed state completely into vapor adding any more heat will increase the temperature now that's where we talked about right here we've changed we have changed the liquid vapor combination into 100% vapor. Any heat that is added, this is our superheat. Any heat that is added is called superheat, and this is where this happens. So that is um, this part of the chart right here. So when you think about superheat, it is heat that is added above the saturation point after it turns into 100% vapor, whether it be water or refrigerant. So if you measure the temperature, if you measure the temperature of your refrigerant or water, and you subtract the saturation temperature from it, what is remaining is the superheat, and this is this is when it's in the vapor form. Now this has a lot to do with refrigeration troubleshooting, which we'll get into in another. Um, webinar but superheat and subcooling are important so subcooling okay so once our vapors change completely back into liquid and we're 100 percent liquid removing heat will d decrease the temperature so we're removing sensible heat so if you take your saturation temperature and then you measure measure the temperature of the liquid, the difference is subcooling. Now, on our chart, that's what happens right down here. So, here we're at saturation point. We're dumping all of the latent heat, latent heat, latent heat, latent heat. At this point, from here, from here downwards, is our is our subcooling. So we'll get into this again in more detail, but there, actually the, the entire refrigeration cycle happens between subcooled liquid through the saturation point up to superheated vapor and then back down again down to this chart. When we get into the refrigeration cycle, we will um, we will explore this chart a little bit further. Okay, gas laws. I know they had Boyle's law, Dalton's law, the law of combined gas. Um, 
what you really need to know is if you compress a gas and reduce its volume, both the temperature and pressure will increase. So if you if you have a piston and you put air in that piston and you compress that piston, um, you think about it, heat is heat and pressure are molecules in motion. So if you reduce the amount of space those molecules have to bounce around, um, that heat is increased and so is the temperature. And conversely, if you expand that gas and put and, and pull that piston back down, both the um, temperature and the pressure will decrease because those molecules that are in motion aren't uh, don't bounce as fast and 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 against each other to create that heat and pressure. So that's the one thing you need to remember uh, with with the gas law. If you increase pressure, you incre increase temperature. If you increase temperature, you increase pressure as well. And the same thing, if you decrease the um, pressure, you decrease the temperature. That, that they happen together. Okay, and here's an example of that. So here's our piston, and we fill this piston with air, and it's at atmospheric pressure, which is 14.7 PSI, and we reduce this piston by half the size. We, we compress this gas, and we reduce the volume in half. It doubles the pressure. It's also going to um, increase the heat because these molecules are bouncing around in here at a at a, whatever rate they are, but if we decrease the area and the volume of where the, these molecules bounce around, they bounce around faster. And when they bounce around faster, that remember heat is our molecules in motion. The more motion, the more heat that's generated. Okay, and this is just an illustration here of a a bottle of liquid that's at its saturation point and its refrigerant um, at 75 degrees, it's 132 PSI. And if we reduce the temperature, it reduces the pressure as well. And if we have this jug over here and we re, uh, we vent off some of this pressure it's and decrease the pressure, it's also gonna decrease the temperature. So remember, pressure increase, temperature increase, pressure decrease, temperature decrease. Make sense? All right. Now, we're still again talking about water. Uh, the changing of state of water at atmospheric pressure happens at 212 degree Fahrenheit. And we can see that right here. This is a uh, pressure temperature chart for water. And the way, when we're looking at any type of pressure temperature chart, this is talking about saturation, temperatures and pressures. That's when we are both liquid and vapor. And if we add any heat, it's going to change state from liquid to vapor. And if we remove heat, it's gonna change state from vapor to liquid. Once we're 100% liquid or 100% vapor, this chart right here has no bearing whatsoever on what's going on. So there are, this is a pressure temperature chart or PT chart for water. And we, we have these charts for refrigerant as well. But let's look at this. This is atmospheric pressure down here at the bottom, 14.7 PSI. And at, four, at atmospheric pressure, water will change state at 212 degrees. Now let's say we um, reduce that atmospheric pressure and we put the water into somewhat of a vacuum, we can change the state of that water at 70 degrees. Fahrenheit. And the same thing happens if you increase the pressure and it it increases the temperature that the water changes state. And we'll get into this again when we get into the refrigeration cycle, this will start to make some more sense. So at 50, 
115 PSI in a, in a pressure cooker. Water doesn't change state until you until it hits the 250 degree Fahrenheit um, range, and that's when it hits saturation, where it's both liquid and vapor are present. And if we add heat, it's going to change state from liquid to vapor. And if we remove heat, it's going to change state from vapor to liquid. OK, and this is just an example. If we have a um, bell jar and we, and we have a vacuum pump and, and back it out, we can make water change state at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so let's get into the basic refrigeration cycle step by step. We're going to go, we'll talk about saturation, um, superheat subcooling, changing of state, and the energy that's required to do this, um, do the refrigeration process as we go along here. All right, so let me clarify some things here to make a little bit more sense. This signifies the wall in your home. On this side of the wall is the indoor unit. This is the blow. 